Romans, Romans chapter number 1, and look with me if you would in verse number 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're here tonight or if you're watching online, I'm encouraging you to have your Bibles with you because we're going to use the Scriptures type. Now jump with me if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And look with me if you would in verse number 2. It says, Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, call to be saints with all that are in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look with me, you would, in verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Go with me, if you would, to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, look with me if you would, in verse 2. It says, And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now go to Ephesians 1. Look verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go to Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Go with me, if you would, to Colossians chapter number 1. It says in Colossians chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1. 1 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1, it says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I read to you 2 Thessalonians. I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians, verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. One more, Philemon and verses 2 and 3. Philemon. Verse 2 of Philemon says, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I know I feel like, you probably think I feel like a broken record up here. It sounds like the same thing over and over. But I wanted you guys, I wanted everybody here to see this. You see a common theme? Grace and peace. Somebody caught it. Grace and peace. If I had to give a title of this message, it would be considered Grace and Peace. Another title I gave to it is Paul's Greeting. 
You may look at this and think, you know, this is just a cliche. I don't think that's what this is. In fact, a little bit later, if I get time, I'm going to share something with you that I believe this is something that Paul took very seriously and that he wanted to be a blessing to those at churches. And this greeting was used as a way to be a blessing to them. Paul genuinely meant these words and that he wanted them to, he had a desire to have these two things. Even if he didn't, if nothing else, God meant every bit of these words. Grace and peace. You know, it's interesting. You think of anything that you could possibly imagine that you could have and that you could give to someone. You think of toys for children. You think of money to help somebody. You think of a home. You think of cars in our day and age. And in Paul's day and age, I'm sure there's a lot of things you could give somebody. But Paul said it to these churches, if there's one thing I want you to have, if there's something I could give to you, if there's something that God could give to you, that I want God to give to you, it would be grace and it would be peace. Now, I look at this, uh, these introductions, and they're going to lead to the message tonight, these greetings, so to say. I want to look at three parts of the greetings. If we get it all in tonight, great. If not, it's okay. We'll look at more of it on Sunday. But these three parts I'll go ahead and give to you, and then we'll come back. We see the recipients of the greeting. We see also the contents of the greeting, and then we see the source of the greeting. And I want to look at those three parts tonight. If we have time, if not, I'll go as far as the Lord allows but let's start with that first one, the recipients of the greeting. I believe this is an important aspect because who receives the writing determines what's going to be in that writing, so to say. For example, if I was to write something to a child, or actually, in fact, if I was to give this message to a child, I like teaching the toddlers downstairs. I sometimes te I teach the juniors in junior church. And when I teach those children, I, can't, I can take the same message and give to them what I give to you. But I do it in a different form. Why? Because who's receiving it? i got to put it in a different way to where it's at their understanding. And God gives this message in a way to a certain recipient. And we ought to know who that recipient is because that's going to help us understand what this grace and peace is all about. Uh, not only that, it's going to help us understand why these things are going on. Uh, maybe you husbands write a uh, note to your wife. You know, you're, you're going to write certain materials that is going to encourage her as your wife. Um, I was reading this week, and I saw some, how that rhyme go. I think it went, apples are great, tacos are delicious. Uh, I use paper plates because I hate doing dishes. Um, you know, that may be a poem, but that's not exactly the poem you're going to put in a note to your wife probably. Why? It make a great joke, but that's not showing your love to her. And we look at this, the who these, this letter is to, it helps us to understand a little bit more about this, I think. Who was this written to? Who is this? And by the way, I mentioned this, God is the final author of this, who says this. Yes, these are Paul's writings. These are Paul's letters to these churches. But he is inspired by God to write these. You got your scriptures? Go to 2 Timothy. I'm going to get you moving around. I love hearing those pages turn. 2 Timothy. Look with me if you in chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, 16. Some of you may have this verse memorized. But all Scripture is given by, what's that word? Inspiration of God and is profitable. That's what's good for you. It's beneficial for you. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God is the final authority behind all Scripture. We have the Scriptures given to us from Almighty God. I don't know about you, that's encouraging to me. These are the very words God would have me to have to help me and direct me in my life. Go with me, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. I want to step out of the camera for a minute. I'm going to grab this water. Second Peter 1 verse 20 says this. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, 
But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So yes, Paul was the individual God used to pen these words, but we are reminded that God is the, man, or God is the one behind his, this man writing these words. And when God is talking about this grace and peace, and when he's speaking to this audience, it's like he is speaking to them himself. This is a message from the Lord to these individuals. Now, I think it's interesting is about Paul's writings here. These, this writing that he's writing is to a very specific group. And as I mentioned, that's important. Why do you say that? Because the message, the application here is going to be for this group of people. Now, I say this, all of God's word is for everyone. God, anybody can come to God's word and they can come to this and learn from it and they can take the truth and apply it to their lives. But you got to understand some of the scriptures is written for a specific purpose. I think of Isaiah. I love studying Isaiah in college. Isaiah wrote, was a prophet. He had messages, but he had messages to several different people from Israel to the nations around Israel. And if you read that message, it was specifically written to that individual. I think of Nahum. Nahum, Nahum was a message for Nineveh. Jonah is a book that we all read, but many of us are probably familiar with the story or the account of Jonah. He had a direct message to Nineveh. Now, what am I trying to get at? That direct audience, that message was for them. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That 40 days was for Nineveh. That judgment that was coming was for Nineveh. I don't read that and go, okay, 40 days and God's going to overthrow me. 40 days, I'm going to be overthrown. Now, is there principles in the book of Jonah that can apply to me? Certainly. As we're going to see with this passage is that there are principles here that applies to us as well. Why do I say all these? Because there are certain verses here, I think of in Colossians. You know, the scripture says in Colossians, the hope that is lay up, laid up for you in heaven. You may have heard that phrase, the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. But I'm not going to go down to the local bar and say to someone that is clearly lost and say, hey, the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. There's hope for you in heaven. Why is that? Because they don't know Jesus Christ. That is not a promise he can claim yet. And you and I, when we look at this particular passage, there's a truth here in this grace. There's a truth here in this peace. But it's applied to a certain individual. With that in mind, who is Paul's specific audience that he's writing to? All of these writings that he's writing, they're written to churches with the exception of three. And I didn't read those three. Those are First and Second Timothy and Titus. You know, he uses the same greeting there, grace and peace, but he adds another word in those ones. He adds mercy. That's an interesting study for another time on the fact of grace, mercy, and peace to the pastors of the church. But the rest of these that we have read, Paul is talking to an audience and he's telling this church audience that they are, he wants the church to have grace and the church to have peace. And I'm going to say more about that in just a moment. But before I do, I want to think about this idea of this church in these passages. As I was studying this and meditating on these things, it's interesting to me, there are several things Paul mentions about the churches in these passages that he didn't address and say that this is how the church is, but he wrote it as if that's what he expected the church to be already. And I think we've come a long way in 2022 where people call, just use the word church loosely for to describe anything. And Paul clearly lays out in these verses, I believe, some characteristics about churches that I think is important for us to know. You look at the book of Romans. He calls those in the church saints. Does anybody know what the word saints means in the scriptures? You get a concordance out and you do a study. It's amazing to me. The word saints here in these scriptures is the same word we translate in other places as holy. We've gotten away from that, haven't we? Holy. In other words, when God is talking about saints, and when Paul, under the inspiration of God, calls these people saints, it's not that he's asking them to be these things. Paul talks as if that's how these people are supposed to be. That's just the norm. It is a foreign concept in the scriptures for God's people in the house of God to not be holy. 
God expects His people to live holy lives. The Scripture still says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. God sets the example, His perfection, His holiness. Do you realize that it's because of the holiness of God that God is a righteous judge? And do you realize it's the love of God that sent His Son to die for you so that way that holiness can be appeased? And we take it for granted, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and live however we want to. Paul looks at these individuals and says, it's as if he's saying, calls them holy ones. Do you and I live a testimony that in our lives, when others see us, they say, you know what? That person's holy. I can see. Can they look at you and understand what holiness is? All too many Christians today, they want to live like the world on Monday through Saturday, and then they'll dress up and they'll play the part in church on Sunday. We don't need that. We need people that love the Lord enough to say, you know what, God, you did this for me. I'm willing to live a holy life. There's many a Christian today, they don't, it's not that they desire to live unholy, but if a lost person was to come up to him and says, well, how do you live a holy life? They wouldn't know what a holy life is. They wouldn't be able to look in the Scripture and say, you know, well, a holy person, they live this way. They do these things. And an unholy person, they live this way. That ought not to be so. The devil has done well in making the church look gray to where people can't tell the difference between it and the world. Some churches you go into today, and there's nothing wrong with having coffee at a church, I don't think, but some churches you go today, you don't know if you're walking into a church or you're walking into a coffee shop. Uh, There's some places you don't know if you're walking into books a million or you're walking into a church. Again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with coffee or books. But I personally, I'd be able to walk through these doors and realize where they're at. And they're not at a rock concert. They're not in the, some place of this world. They're here to learn. They ought to be able to come through those doors and realize this is a place where I can figure out what, who God is. The church ought to be holy. God's people ought to be holy. Not only in Romans, but you look at the book of Corinthians. It's called the church of God. The church of God. I look at that and I say, you know, the church is to be of God, so to say. It's to be something from God. It's based in God and the teachings of His Word. It's not the church of bacon. And you think that's a joke. There's a place called that. That's not church. It's not based in God. And if you go to these places called church, but they teach you you can work your way to heaven, or you can teach you you can pray to this individual and everything will be okay, that's not following God's Word. That's not church. Our place, the church, ought to be after God. He ought to be the leader of the church. We're not following an organization. We're following the Lord. We follow our pastor as he follows God. It is the church of God in Corinthians. Again, he calls them saints, and he calls them sanctified, which is, means to make holy. And it's interesting. This is one of the key elements of those in the church. And you may have been a part of a church, so to say, but if you do not have this element, you are not a part of the body of Christ. He calls those in Corinthians, those that call upon the name of Jesus. They're saved individuals. This is a place where saved individuals gather together to worship the Lord. Now, we're not saying lost people don't come here. No, we ought to be a light to them. They ought to be able to come here and find the Lord. What I'm saying is that the body of believers is made up of saved individuals we find in the book of Corinthians. Galatians calls it churches as well. You know, a church is a called out assembly. You look at the definition, it's a called out assembly. And that assembly, as we just mentioned, is a group of believers. You don't have a called out assembly in a virtual world. 
Now, again, I think virtual stuff, it's a wonderful tool. We can use that. But you're missing out on things that the church functions that you do not get in a virtual world. He calls them churches, called out assembly. Ephesians calls them saints. He mentions that they are the faithful. Now, remember what I said. The churches, these are things that Paul just, he didn't say to be this. He said, this is something he expects of God's people. It's that he, doesn't, he doesn't have to defend it. This is what they are. Faithful. God's people ought to be faithful. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. We shouldn't be, it shouldn't take somebody twisting our arms the desire to be a part of the house of God, to be involved in things in the house of the Lord. It shouldn't be that way. There ought to be a hunger and desire produced in somebody when the Holy Spirit moves in, He resides in your body, there ought to be that desire to say, you know what, I want to be around God's people. I need the preaching of God's Word. I want to grow. You know, we shouldn't have to beg people to want a desire to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. When you get saved, or at least and that's how it was for me, when you trust Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit moves in. He does that work in you. And you want to be faithful. There's more Christians today that would love to be more faithful to make sure their TV's turned on to that sports game each and every week than to be in the Bible each and every day. And that's a shame. There, we ought to be faithful in this book. We ought to have a desire and a hunger as the heart panted after the water book that the psalmist said. That's what we ought to be like. Just like a deer that's hungry or thirsty for that water, we ought to be hungry and thirsting after this book and understanding and wanting to know what it says for me. Some people make the argument, well, I just don't know what I got, so I just, it's, not, it's just not worth it. I always use the illustration. The Bible is called spiritual food. Most of us today could not tell what we ate on January the 8th at 2 o'clock. Most of us probably don't know what we ate. But I'm sure most of us are glad we ate something at that time. You know, this is your spiritual food. And you know, when we get to December, you may be thinking, now what did God speak to my heart about back in April? But you know what? You ought to be able to say, you know what? I'm not sure, but I'm glad that he did that day. I'm glad I spent time in the book. I'm glad I got something for that day. We ought to be faithful. Hey, we ought to be faithful to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to be faithful. God ought to be able to depend upon us. Again, Paul is saying this like this is the natural thing for a Christian. I need to hasten on. We're probably going to pick this back up on Sunday. The faithful. You look at Colossians. He calls them saints and faithful brethren. It's a family. The body of believers is a family. And I don't know how your family functions, but there ought to be a family-like love in the house of God. The psalmist describes it as unity. There ought to be unity there. You know, it's a sad thing when a church has an issue that people can't get along because someone takes a parking spot. We ought to be close enough as a family of God that we can get along. He calls them brethren. I like what Philippians said. He called them saints with the bishops and the deacons. You ought to be with your pastor. You ought to be for your pastor. The church doesn't need someone that the pastor gets up and the Lord's laid something on his heart and he wants to head a direction after this book. It doesn't need someone that says, well, I, just, I don't think we need to do that. I don't see why you would want to do that, pastor. Well, I mean, why, what, what's the point of doing that here in such a little place like this? We don't need that. God's house ought to have people that are holy and with their pastor and the deacons. It ought to be that way. When the pastor is following God's word and following the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to follow him. You know, if he's following in the footsteps of Christ, you're not going to waver in a wrong direction following those same footsteps. There's too many people though that want to split churches. Too many people that want to, they want to be the one to run the church. Well, listen, why don't you start your own church? Why do you have to destroy a church that already exists that God's working through? With the brethren, with the, uh, with the bishops, and with the deacons. And I think it's interesting, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, if Philemon calls these churches. 
And one, in fact, was a church in a house. You know, believers in that day and age did something a little different. A lot of the churches, they went to house to house. It was in a house. Now, I said all that to say this, and I'm going to wrap this up. We'll get to the other two on Sunday. What's some things we can learn about this church based on the things that Paul just assumed that this is how the church ought to be? Here's the first one I had listed down. The church has responsibilities. We have responsibilities. A lot of people like to live in the dugout instead of being out in the field and doing something. We have responsibilities, and we ought to know how we ought to behave in the house of God. You know, that's why Paul wrote that book of Timothy. He wrote to him that he may know how to behave in the house of God. You know, if you read those books, you'll know what you're supposed to do in the house of God. Because he addresses to the older men what they're supposed to do in those books, as well as in the book of Titus. He addresses to the older women what they're supposed to do. He addresses the younger ladies what they're supposed to do, the young men. He addresses those things. You read Paul's writings, you'll find how children are to behave, how husbands and wives are to behave. You know, we have responsibilities, and we ought to do our best to fulfill those duties and those responsibilities. I find this, this is the second thing I've written. It's, the church is not to ju just act any old way, and it's okay as long as people come to Jesus Christ. That's not right. But that's the idea and the mentality of a lot of churches today. We'll do whatever it takes to see a soul come to Jesus Christ. Now, we are all for people coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. But we do not neglect the important principles and the truths of holiness just to see people saved. God does not ask us to sin just so someone comes to Him. Here's a third truth. I only got two more. The behavior of the church is more important than the crowd size. Nowhere in these greetings, when Paul addresses these churches, does he address how big that church is. In fact, he says one's in a house. Maybe he had a mansion. I don't know what Philemon had. But he's not addressing their size. He's addressing their behavior, how they behave. Don't be discouraged when you look around and see the numbers and they're not what you like. Be discouraged if you look around and you see people that are not the way they are supposed to be. Because God is concerned how the church acts, how the church behaves. As I study the scriptures and I read the book of Acts, I think it's interesting in Acts chapter number 2 that the Lord added unto the church. I strongly believe with my whole heart that if we as a church do what we ought to be, God will bring people to his church because he knows this is where they can learn and this is where they can grow. Can God bring somebody to Calvary Baptist Church and you be the person to help them be what they ought to be? Our behavior matters. And the last truth I have about this that I noticed about Paul, it's about a person more than a program. Again, this is going to be more toward the third point, but you notice how where he said this grace and peace come in each and every one of these churches. He said, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how the church is the function, based on what God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ wants, not what man wants. Our first thought ought not to be when we go to church, I wonder what kind of program they have. And there's nothing wrong with programs. Our first thought ought to be, what are they doing with this book? And what are they, do are they doing it God's way? Because that's what matters. There's some really good churches out there that may not have the big fancy programs, but I'll tell you what, they're centered around this book and that's where a person's going to grow. And that's where they're going to get to know God. And that's where they can come to know who Jesus is and grow in that knowledge of him. There's a lot of churches out there that have big programs and they leave just as confused about God as when they showed up there. And that ought not to be. I pray at Calvary Baptist Church that we would be the church we ought to be. And when we are the church, we ought to be. That's the audience Paul is speaking to. And on Sunday, Lord, we're going to talk about that grace and peace. Because that's what God wants us as a church to have. He wants us to have grace. He wants us to have peace. And we'll look at how we can do those things on Sunday. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.